just so you know. This is the abuse that I get. Daniel. Okay, so we started it and then the chaos begins. That is the normal, the normal daily. So we started the book of Mark yesterday. Are we going to be able to read Mark? Yeah. Okay. So this is Mark chapter two. This is one of my 16 favorite chapters in the book of Mark, which is one of my four favorite gospels. <clears throat> All right. Are we ready? Everybody's ready. All right. Good. Mark chapter two. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there, were, there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they, had, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive, to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's... John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and the people and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and the worst tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, 
and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. <clears throat> One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's the end of chapter 2. And we will continue with chapter 3 tomorrow. So, are we ready to read Dragon Singer now? We're on uh, Dragon Singer chapter 8. Chapter 8. Hello. Okay. Wow, it opened right to it. Um, it's eight, right? Thank you. Okay. Dragon Singer, Chapter 8. Gather, gather, it's a gather day. No work for us and threads away. Stalls are building, squares swept clear. Gather all from far and near. Bring your marks and bring your wares. Bring your family for there's food and drink and fun and song. The hold flag flies, so gather along. I'm going to move this up. <laughs> okay, hopefully I won't hit my foot on it like last night. <clears throat> What's wrong with the hold? Mentally asked Primer the next morning as she, the boy, and Camo were feeding the fire lizards. Primer kept craning his neck past the roofs of the Harbor Hall to see the fire heights of Fort Hold. Nothing's wrong. I want to see if the gather flag's up. Gather flag? Mentally recalled that Siebel had mentioned a gather. Sure, it's spring and sunny. It's a, it's a rest day. Thread's not due, so there ought to be a gather. Heimer regarded her a long moment, then his face screwed up into an incredulous expression. You mean you don't have gathers? Half Circle is isolated, mentally replied defensively, and with thread falling. Yeah, I forgot that. No wonder that you're such a smashing musician, he said, shaking his head as if this were no real compensation. Nothing to do but practice. Still, he added, somewhat skeptical, you must have had gathers before a thread fall. Of course we did. Traders came through the marshes three or four times a turn. Primer was unimpressed, mentally realized that she herself had only the vaguest memories of such events. Threadfall had started when she was barely eight turns old. We have gathers as often as it's sunny on a rest day, Primer said, chattering away, and there isn't any thread due, of course, our being a hold with several small craft halls as well as the main harbor craft hall does make for great gathers. You don't happen, and he cocked his head slightly, to have any marks on you. Marks? Primer was thoroughly disgusted with her obtuseness. Marks! Marks! What you get in exchange for what you're selling at a gather. He reached into his pocket and pulled out four small white pieces of highly polished wood on which the numerals 32 had been incised on one side and on the other the mark of the smithcraft. Only 30 seconds, but with four, I got an eighth and Smithcraft at that. Mentally had never actually seen marks before. All trading transactions had been carried out by her father, the sea holder. She was astonished that so young a boy as Pimer had possession of marks and said so. Oh, I sang, you know, even before I got apprentice. I'd always get a mark of some amount or other. My foster mother kept them for me until I came here. Pimer, Pimer wrinkled his nose in disgust. But you don't get paid for singing at gathers if you're a harper, and you have to do your turn anyway. I haven't anything to give the marksmen here. I keep trying, but Master Jarrett won't put his seal on my pipes, 
So I have to figure out other ways to start turning the odd. Hey, look, Menely, and he grabbed her arm. The, there goes the flag, there'll be a gather. He went flying across the court as fast as he could to the apprentice dormitory. On the top of the fort hold fire heights, Menely now saw the bright yellow pennant and flapping below it on the ma mast, the red and black barrier streamer that apparently signaled a gather. She heard Pimer's cries echoing in the apprentice dormitory and the sounds of sleepers stirring in complaint. As if Pimer's sighting of the pennant had been a signal, the drudges, herded by Abuna and Silvina, entered the kitchen. The flag and pennant of, on the hold mast were duly noted and the meal preparations were conducted in a cheerful humor. Menely dispersed for her fare to the sunning and bathing and finding Silvina in the kitchen with Abuna, offered to take breakfast to the harper and his bronze, whom he'd named Zare. I told you, Abuna, with the, that with Menely to help, two more fire lizards would be no problem, Silvina said, pushing the kitchen woman onto some other task as she smiled warmly at Menely. Not that the harper will be here much with his, nor Siebel either, she called to Abuna, who went off grumbling to herself. Long as she's lived in the harper hall, you'd think she'd be used to ch change about. Menely wanted to ask Sylvina about the girls and their gossiping, but Sylvina was avoiding her eye. Just then, they both heard Menely's name being called in a frantic voice. Siebel came crashing down the kitchen steps, holding up his trousers with one bare arm, wincing at the clutch of his fire lizard queen on the other. Kimmy was creeling wildly with hunger. Menely, there you are. I've been searching everywhere. What's the matter with her? Ouch! Siebel was wide-eyed with anxiety. She's only hungry. Only hungry? Well, I'm hungry. Go lay down. <laughs> the girl's rude. Just okay. Here, come with me. And Menely took Siebel by the arm, picked up the tray she had prepared for the Master Harper, and pulled the journeyman out of the kitchen to spare him Abuna's black scowl and into the relative peace of the dining hall. Now feed her. I can't. My pants. Siebel nodded to his trousers, which Beltless threatened to slip off his hips. Stifling a giggle, Menely unbuckled her own worn belt and secured Siebel's pants for him. He grabbed a handful of meat and held it out for Kimmy. The ungrateful wretch hissed and lunged at the meat, digging her claws into his forearm. Well, Menely couldn't give him her, her tunic, too. She spotted a scrap of toweling by the service hatch. Deftly, she disengaged the queen's legs from Siebel's forearm and wrapped the cloth about his scratched and bleeding arm, then managed to redeposit Kimmy before the queen was aware of being shifted. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, sighed Siebel, sinking to the nearest bench. And you had nine of these creatures to feed every day? He gave her a look of renewed respect. I don't know how you did it. I really don't. Mentally pointed to his claw as she took up a handful of meat. Kimmy didn't care whose hand held the meat, so Siebel gratefully gulped some claw. Mentally, another voice roared from the top of the stairs. Sir? Mentally dashed to the foot of the steps. He's making the most outlandish noises, the harper yelled. Is he hung hurt or just hungry? His eyes are flaming red. Here you are, said Sylvina, appearing from the kitchen with a second tray of good of food for human and fire lizard. I thought we'd be hearing from him once Siebel appeared. Menely could not keep from laughing with Sylvina. She took the, the steps two at a time without spilling so much as a drop of the claw or tumbling a glob of meat from the piled bowl. The harper had taken time to dress, and he thought to wrap his arm against the needle-sharp claws of his little bronze, but he looked not a whit less harried or distressed than Siebel. You're sure it's only hunger? asked Master Robinton, but his fire lizard's creeling abated with the first mouthful of meat. Robinton gestured mentally towards his quarters, but the fire lizard, believing the food was being withdrawn, let out an indignant shriek and swatted at Menlily's hand. Here, here, eat, you greedy thing, said the harper with great affection in his voice. Just don't wake everyone, it's rest day. Too late, remarked Domic in an acid tone of voice, his sleeping rug pulled around him as he stood in the doorway of his room. Between you howling like an injured dragon, people sounding like a flight of them, and these pesky beasts with tones that could bend metal, no one's going to enjoy a rest day. The gather flag is flying, the harper said in a conciliatory way. He continued to feed Zare, and he and Menely proceeded to his room. A gather? That's all I need, Domic slammed his door. I trust there won't be a repetition of this. 
said Master Marshall as the harper and mentally came abreast of his room. He wore a loose robe and he was obviously, but he obviously had been drawn from his bed with the creelings and shouts. His sour gaze was directed fully on mentally as if she were the sole cause of the commotion. Probably, the harper replied cheerfully, until I figure out this precious creature's habits. He only hatched yesterday, Marshall. Don't give, do give him a few days grace. Marshall spluttered something, glared balefully and accusingly at Mentally, and then shut his door pointed, pointedly without slamming it. Mentally all too clearly heard other doors closing along the corridor, and she was very grateful to be in the Harper's company. Don't let old Marshall upset you, Mentally, said Master Robinson in a quiet voice. Mentally looked up quickly, graceful for his reassurance. He smiled again as he nodded for her to enter his room and gestured for her to set the tray down on the center of the sand table. Fortunately, he went on, slouching in a chair, all the while supplying meat bits for Zare. You don't have to sit classes with Morshaw. I don't? Robinson chuckled at the note of relief in her voice and then laughed again as Zare missed a morsel, creeling anxiously until the harper had retrieved it from the floor and deposited it neatly in the open mouth. No, you don't. Marshall teaches only at the apprentice level, the master harper sighed. He really is adept at drilling basic theory into rebellious apprentice minds. But Petrian always taught you more than Marshall knows. Relieved mentally? Oh, yes, Master Marshall doesn't seem to like me. Master Marshall has always considered it a waste of time and effort to teach any girls. What good would it do them? Mentally blinked, surprised to hear her father's opinion echoed in the Harper Hall. Then she realized that Master Robinson had been speaking in a deft mimicry of Master Marshall's testy manner. Warm fingers caught her chin, and she was made to look up at the Harper. The lines of fatigue and worry were plainly visible, despite his good night's rest. Marshall's dislike of the feminine sex is a standing joke in this hall, mentally. Give him the courtesy, do his rank and age, and ignore his biased thinking. As I said, you don't have to sit classes with him, not that Domic will be any easier to study with. He's a hard taskmaster, but Domic will take over your tuition when Petrian left off in musical form and composition until I can. Unfortunately, and the Harper's smile of regret was sincere, I am badly pressed for time with all that's happening, much though I would prefer to undertake the task myself. Still, Domic's understanding of the truly classical form is superior, and he's keen to monopolize any instrumentalist capable of playing his intricate music. Don't miss your lessons with Master Shonagar, for you must be able to sing your songs effectively, but, and he lifted a warning finger, don't fall for Brutigan's import, importunings about fire lizard choruses. They can be scheduled for a later time when they, we've settled you properly in your craft. I'd like you to concentrate on your instruments as far and as far as far and as fast as that hand of yours permits. How is it healing, by the way? And he reached for her left hand. Hmm, you've done too much by the look of those splits. Does it hurt? I wouldn't, I won't have you crippling yourself in your zeal, Mentally. Understand that. Mentally sensed his kind concern, swallowed against the lump in her throat, and managed a tentative smile. It is never easy, sweet child, to have a real gift. Something else is withheld to compensate. Mentally was startled at the sadness, that melancholy in his eyes and face, and he went on almost to himself. If you won't surrender the mark, You'll never be more than half alive. Speaking of marks, and his expression altered completely, he leaned forward across the sand table, rummaging in the compartments of the central bridge built above the actual sand level. Ah, here. And he pressed something in her hand. There's a gather today, and you deserve some relaxation. I suspect diversions were few and infrequent in your sea hold. Find something pretty to wear at the stalls, a belt perhaps, and buy some of the bubbly pies. Pimer will lead you to them, the scamp. But tomorrow, said Master Robinson, and Master Robinson waggled a finger at her, back to work for you. Siebel says you make a good copyist. Did you have a chance to polish the Breck song yesterday evening? I think you'll agree the melodic line falters in the fourth phrase, and he hummed it. Then I want you to rewrite the ballad observing all the traditional musical forms. Think of it as an exercise in musical theory. Mind you, I'm of the opinion that the strength of your work will lie in a looser, a looser, less formalized style. There are, however, purists in the craft who must be mollified while you're an apprentice. Zare, his belly so swollen that the individual lumps of meat could be discerned against his skin, gave a sudden burp and collapsed into sleep in the crook of the harper's arm. 
I say, mentally, how long will he be nothing? Will he do nothing but eat and sleep? The harper sounded disappointed. The first seven day, and maybe a few days longer, mentally and answered, still trying to assimilate his astonishing instructions and philosophy. He'll develop a personality in a very short time. That's a relief. The harper heaved an exaggerated sigh. I had been worrying that perhaps his brains had got addled going between so much in the egg, not that I'd care for him any less. And he smiled tenderly down at the sprawled form. How did you ever manage to fill nine rapacious bellies? Now her smile was all for her. And what a relief to have you here to help us. This, In this I am your apprentice. His eyes held hers a moment longer, still twinkling with amusement, although his face settled into a serious expression. In all other matters, you are to consider yourself my apprentice, you know. Now you may take the tray back to the kitchen and you are dismissed to the gather, unless of course, he added with that winning smile, something untoward happens to this fellow. She brought the tray and empty dishes to the kitchen where Abuna, with more than her usual courtesy, suggested that Menely had better get some breakfast before it was all gone. They'd be clearing the table soon and if the lazy bones hadn't eaten too bad, not but what they couldn't stuff themselves at the gather stalls. They reminded Menely of the mark that the harper had put in her hand. Oh, that reminded them. At first she thought it was the dim light of the passage, but then but when she got into the entrance hall, she could plainly see that the two was underscored. It, was, it wasn't a half mark, which would have been scored above. She clenched the precious piece in her fist, amazed. Ah, I just realized I cut my thumb at dinner tonight or something. Um, the Master Harper had given her a whole two mark piece to spend on herself. Two whole marks, why she could buy anything. No, he'd said that she was to buy something pretty to wear, a belt. The Harper's keen eye had noted the absence of hers and it was a worn belt anyhow, but a new one instead of one handed down, a belt she could choose for herself. How very kind of Master Robinson, and he'd said she was too busy to buy bubbly pies. She looked about the scattering of boys at the apprentice tables for Pimer's curly head of hair. He was, as usual, deep in conversation with several boys, and probably planning mischief to judge by the closeness of all the heads. There were no masters at the circular table, and just a few journeymen at the oval ones clustered about Siebel, admiring Kimmy, asleep on his arm. She couldn't give him away if she wanted to, Primer was saying in a strident tone as Menley approached his group. Someone must have jabbed him in the ribs because he glanced over his shoulder, and while he looked in no way abashed, it was obvious from the expression on the others that Menley had been the she he'd met. Can you? he asked bluntly. Can I what? Give anyone else one of your fire lizards? No. I told you, Primer pointed an accusing finger at Ranley, so Siebel couldn't have given Robinson the queen. Could he, Menley? But the Master Harper should have had the Queen, said Ranley, rebellious and unconvinced. Siebel did offer the Queen to Master Robinson when she hatched, Menely said quickly, but it was too late. Impression had occurred, and that can't be altered. Well, just how did Siebel get his hands on the Queen egg? Now Ranley's eyes hotly accused her of compl complicity. Completely by accident, she said, mastering her irritation at such an outrageous suggestion. First, there really isn't any positive way to knowing which is the queen egg in a fire lizard clutch. Second, it isn't anyone's business but Master Robinson's and Siebel's. She just lay this divisive rumor into an early grave and repay a little of her great debt to both men. Third, I picked the two biggest eggs in the clutch for Master Robinson, and the boys nodded with approval, but they could have both have been bronzes. Then she laughed. It all happened so fast. When the eggs started to hatch, no one bothered to see which pot was whose. Master Robinson and Siebel just grabbed because both their pots rock, rocking fit to fall. The little bronze hatched first right into Master Robinson's hands and that was that right then. He caught it just before it could fall from the hearthstone. The boys snatched in breath for that near catastrophe. And then there was Siebel with a queen in his hands. Then he tried to give her to the harbor but Zara had impressed and so had Kimmy. There's no way to change that. And I don't want to hear another word from any of you as to who got what and who shouldn't have. There's enough gossip flying about this hall. She wished that she could forget her worries about what those girls had told Lord Holder. I kept trying to tell them, said Pimer, throwing his hands out, his eyes bright with injured innocence because mentally 
was now glaring at him. Then he clutched dramatically at his throat because his voice had squeaked on the last word. I've gone horse talking. Can't have the golden throat horse, can we? said Branley sarcastically. Pimer was testing claw pots on the table to see if there was any that was still warm. Finding one, he poured two mugs, offering one to Mentally. He gurgled and he, as he drowned or downed half a mug, rubbed his hand across his mouth, and then told her that she'd better eat quickly because they'd be clearly, they'd be clearly any minute. Clearing any minute. Clearing any minute. Now let's get back to the mark problem. This will be only the second gather of the turn, so I figure that they'll be sending in older journeymen from the Smithcraft Hall to keep an eye on the younger fellows and supervise the bargaining. And that journeyman is just likely to be my father's friend, Pergamol. And if it's Pergamol, then I can guarantee that you'll get top marks for your work. And he held up a silencing hand as Ranley opened his mouth to com comment. If it isn't Pergamol, it'll be someone who knows him. And if it's just a young journeyman who's on to you, Pimer, Ranley asked in a caustic tone, then I blubber. Pimer dismissed this problem with all the disdain of the practiced dissembler. I'm just a little feller and I never have much. And I, great tears welled up in his eyes and his face was a mask of trusting and anxious innocence. If I may disturb this tactical meeting, said a different voice and all the boys looked guiltily around to see Siebel, Fire Lizard cradled in his arm for a few words with Menely. She rose and followed the journeyman to the window. He pressed her rolled up belt in her, in her hand and he thanked her for saving his dignity that morning. Now, can I keep Kimmy with me all the time? He asked, lightly stroking the Fire Lizard's folded wings. Even in her sleep, she responded to his touch with a sigh. Nam. The more she's with you, the stronger the bond will grow. If not on you, near you. Okay. Is she too young to be taught to sit on my shoulder like your beauty does? I've got to have both hands for a while today. When she wakes, put her on your shoulder, Menly grinned, and get used to having your neck throttled. How often does she eat? She'll let you know, Menly laughed at Siebel's consternation. At least you don't have to go catch it. Keep a few meat rolls in your belt pouch, although I'm sure Camo will always be ready to chop chop for you anytime. Siebel chuckled too. One thing you'll need to do at daily is oil her skin. Does it have to stink like the stuff you use? Siebel was dismayed, mentally suppressed a giggle. Master Oldive had that oil on hand. He said he makes it for the ladies of the hold to use on their faces. Oh no. But I'm sure he'd make you something more suitable for your... He paused, or she paused, not certain just how much she could tease Siebel. My male dignity and rank, Siebel grinned at her. I'll just have a word with him now. And he strolled off with a lilt in his step. Mentally was very pleased that she'd suppressed the boy's misapprehension over the fire lizard's hatching. Siebel was so nice. And it wasn't as if Master Robin had been upset at impressing the bronze. He genuinely hadn't cared a whit once Sarah had impressed and was his very own. And if Master Robinson was content, the rest of the hall shouldn't quarrel. Then she worried about the girl's gossip. If the apprentices could take a simple switch like the hatching and derive deep insult from it, what had the girls done with her reputation at the hold? Look, Menely, Pimer said, popping up beside her. I got a couple of things to do now, but after dinner, you want me to take you around the gather, seeing as how you haven't been to one? Here, that is. She readily agreed, curious to see just how his plans would affect his bargaining. He darted out of the hall then and other boys hard on his heels. A few journeymen still lounged at the oval table drinking claw, but most of the apprentices had dispersed. At the round table, Master Marshall now glowered darkly at her as he ate in solitary dignity. Mentally left the dining hall for the sanctuary of her room. Her fire lizards were curled up on the deep window ledge, their wings glinting brilliantly in the sun but their jeweled eyes closed behind their several lids. Beauty stirred, raised her head, parted the outer lid, squeaked softly, and when mentally stroked her reassuringly, sighed and resumed her interrupted nap. Boys, do you need to get in bed? Okay. <clears throat> From the vantage point of the next or the second level, mentally could see the square beyond the Harper Hall and the broad roadway. There was already considerable activity. 
burdened beast moving up the river road, their slow, long stride one of indolence, rather than labor under heavy weights. Stalls were being assembled, forming a loose square about an open space. Tables and benches were already in place facing the dance square. For dancing, there would be would surely be, with a hundred or more harpers to do the playing. There'd be more dancing than she'd ever seen, and probably different dances from the ones popular in her sea hold. Oh, this would be a grand gather, her first here and her first since thread started falling. Mentally caught sight of the girls emerging from the cot, brightly clad with filmy scarves to protect their hair from the light wind. Oh, what she'd like to do with their hair. Hona's hair with its long, neat plates to be pulled out by the roots. Mentally stopped her thoughts, a little appalled at the intensity of her dislike. After all, the girls had failed of their aim to prejudice Lord Grow against her. Why she was why was she bothered or bothering her head about them? She'd better things to occupy herself with. She was an apprentice harper, not a sometimes student. She was Master Harper Robinson's apprentice. Of course, since he was master of the Harper Hall, everyone within was his apprentice. But she was an apprentice, and she intended to remain one, more than ever now that the girls had made an effort to jeopardize her tenure. She was going to stay to spite them and her parents, and she was going to make her place here because this was where she belonged, as Master Robinson had said. Here was where she could perfect her music. Here she could make her own place for herself, not slip into a spot left by someone else, anyone else. Just as she'd made the cave her own, she would make her own place here in the Harper Hall, and no one, particularly a sneaky little Twitter head whose only claim to importance was being someone's granddaughter, was going to dislodge her, or a conniving coward like Cotfolder Dunka. Mentally wondered if Sylvina had... She's finally grown some backbone. Mentally wondered if Sylvina had done anything about settling the rumors. Really, it just wasn't important, Mentally told herself sternly, particularly when Lord Gro seemed to approve of her and had actually suggested that she help him train his queen, Mergen. Mentally laughed to herself, just wait till those little sissies heard about that. She, a she apprentice trainer of fire lizards, the only successful one on Pern, the teacher just one step ahead of the student. She giggled now, covering her mouth with her hands because she knew she was acting the weary. But she'd been silly not to see before that she had several tunes to play in this, in this Harper Hall. The tunes she made, her fire lizards, yes, and how to gut a fish and trim sail whenever some Harper needed to know. And why did Siebel need to know? She sighed gustily. Too bad about those girls, though. She wished Audiva didn't have to stay with them. She was above the general sword of the cot, and it would have been nice to have a girlfriend. Not that she didn't have a good friend in Pimer. When Pimer grew up and lost his brilliant voice, would he have to leave the craft hall? No, because they must surely be training him to play one of those other tunes. She didn't quite see him stepping into Master Shonagar's slippers. She rose from the window ledge, reminded that the task of the task that Master Robinson had set her as his apprentice, she turned her guitar and began to rehearse the Breck song, softly lest the harper was busy in his rooms. Did he honestly think that song, a twiddle, to while the time away until Siebel returned, was good enough to be perfected? Of, the, her, of their own volition, her fingers were plucking out the melody. She found herself caught up once more in the poignancy of Breck's anguished command, Don't leave me alone! She played the song through, agreeing with the harper that the fourth phrase needed polishing. Ah, yes, if she dropped to the fifth, it would intensify the phrase and complement the chord. The tocsin rang for mealtime finally, and shouts and laughter broke her concentration. She was almost angry with the disruption, but with a renewed awareness of her surroundings, she realized how her hand ached. Her back and neck muscles were stiff from crouching over the guitar. She'd no idea she'd been practicing that long, but the song was set in her mind and her fingers now. She would have it finished and next to no time once she had more ink and those paper sheets. She changed into the clothes she wanted to wear to the gather, not as rich as the girls would be wearing, but new. The close woven trousers and the contrasting colored tunic with the sleeveless hide jumper displaying the apprentice's badge meant more to her than fine cloth and filmy scarves. As she pulled on her slippers, she noticed that the constant scuffing on the stone floor 
Flores was wearing soles and toes out. At least here, she needn't fear to approach Sylvina, and perhaps her feet were healed enough for proper boots, which would last longer. All right, we just finished chapter eight, and we're only 34 minutes in, so I'm going to try to read chapter nine. Um, less than 20. Less than 20. Ooh. All right. <clears throat> the fickle wins my foe with tide, his keen ally. They're jealous of my sea's love and rouse her with their lie. Oh, sweet sea, oh, dear sea, heed not thy stormy, their stormy wile, but bear me safely to my hold and from their watery trial, eastern sea holds on. There was an excitement in the air of the dining hall, the boys chattering more loudly than ever, a conversational buzz that dropped off only slightly when they were seated and the heavy platters of steaming meat slices were brought around. She sat with Ranley, Pimer, and Timony, who all urged her to eat heartily for they'd be lucky to get stale bread for supper. Sylvina counts on our stuffing ourselves on our own marks at the gather. Pimer told mentally as she crammed meat into his mouth, or as he crammed meat into his mouth. He groaned as she heaped tubers on his plate. I hate him. You're lucky to have him. They were treats where I come from. Then you have mine. He was generously, he was generosity itself, but she made him eat his own. No one spent time over the meal and the dinners were dismissed as soon as Brudigan had called out the list of names. Well, I'm not on a turn today, said Pimer with the air of the last minute reprieve. Turn? Yeah, being Harper Hall and all, this hold expects continuous music, music, but no one does more than one set, either singing or dance music. No great problem. You know, Menely, you'd better tell your filers to stay away, Pimer said as they all made their way across the courtyard to the archway. The other boys nodded in agreement. No telling what ragtag is going to appear at the gather. He sounded darkly foreboding. Who'd heard a fire lizard, Menely asked, surprised. Not heard him, just want him. Menely looked up and saw her friends sunning on the window ledges. As if her notice was sufficient, Beauty and Rocky came streaking down to her, chirping inquiringly. Couldn't I just take Beauty? No one would. No one sees her when she hides in my hair. Pimer shook his head slowly from side to side. The other boys mimicked him with earnest expressions of concerns. We, and he met Harper's, know about you and having nine, where there are some dimwits coming today who wouldn't understand, and you're wearing an apprentice badge. Apprentices don't own nothing or count for anything. They're the lowest of the low and have to obey any journeyman or master or even a senior apprentice in any other craft. Shells, you know how beauty acts when someone tries to rank you. You can't have beauty taking a swipe at an honorable journeyman or a craft master now, can you? Or someone from the hold? He jerked his thumb towards the cliffside as he dropped his voice to keep the mere possibility of such discourtesies from exalted ears. That would get Master Robinson in trouble, considering the gossip work already done in the hold. Menely would as soon remain anonymous to them. He could, Branley and Timley nodded in solemn accord. How do you manage to stay out of trouble, Pimer? Menely asked. Because I watch my step at a gather. One thing to cut up in the hall when it's all harbors, but... Hey, Pimer, they all turned and saw Broly and another apprentice with whom Menely did, did not know running towards them. Broly had a brightly painted tambourine and the other a handsomely polished tenor pipe. Hold on, sorry. Okay, there's no comments. Like, I can't even tell if anybody's watching. <laughs> everybody's here in my, everybody's here in my family room that listens. Okay. Um. <clears throat> All right. Thought we might have missed you, Pimer, the boy gasped. Here's my pipe, and Master Jarrett stamped it in Brawley's tambourine. Will you take him to the marksman now? Sure, and it's my friend's friend, Pergamol, like I told you it would be. Pimer took charge of the instruments and with a quick, with a quirk of a smile at Benelli, led the way towards the loosely arranged stalls on the perimeter of the gathered square. For the first time, Menely realized how many people lived in this seat, in this hold area. She would have liked to watch a bit of, on the sidelines to get used to such a throng of people, but grabbing her hand, Pimer led her right into the midst. 
She nearly piled into Pimer when he came to a sudden complete stop in the space between two booths. He glanced warningly over his shoulder and mentally noticed that he had the instruments behind his back as he composed his face into an expression of wistful ingenuousness. A tanner journeyman was bargaining with the well-dressed marksman and in the stall, his Smithcraft badge gleaming with a gold thread in the design. See, it is Pergamal, Pimer said out of the side of his mouth. Now you lot go on across there to the knife stand until I'm finished. Men don't like a lot of hangers about when they're re agreeing the mark. No, mentally, you can stay. Pimer snatched her back by the jerkin as she obediently started to follow the others. Although mentally could see Pergamal's lips moving, she heard nothing of his speech and only an occasional murmur from the bargaining journeyman. The Smithcraft marksman continually stroked the finely tanned wear hide as he dickered, almost as if he hoped to find some flaw in the hide so he could argue a further reduction. The hide was a lovely blue, like a summer sky when the air is clean or clear and the sun setting. Probably died to order, Pimer whispered to her. Selling it direct neither has to pay a turnover fee. With us, once Jarrett has stamped the instrument, the marksman doesn't have to say it was apprentice made. So we get a better price not selling at the Harper booth where they have to say who made it. Now Menelay could appreciate Pimer's strategy. The bargain was hand sealed and marks slipped across the counter. The blue hide was carefully folded, put away in a travel bag. Pimer waited until the journeyman had chatted as courtesy required, and then he skipped to the front of the stall before anyone else could intervene. Back so soon, young rascal. Well, let's, let's have a look at what you've brought. Hmm, stamped as you said, Pergamal examined more than the stamp of the tambourine mentally noticed, and the smithcrafter's eyes slid to hers as he pinged the stretch hide of the tambourine with his finger and raised his eyebrows at the sweet sound tinkle of the little symbols under the rim. So, how much were you looking to receive for it? Four marks, said Pimer, with the attitude that he was being eminently reasonable. Four marks, Pergamal feigned astonishment, and the interchange of bargaining began in earnest. Mentally was delighted and more than a little impressed by Pimer's shrewdness when the final figure of three and a half marks was hand clasped. Pimer had pointed out that for a journeyman made tambourine, four marks was not unreasonable. Pergamal did not have to say who made it, and he saved a 30-second on turnover. Pergamal replied that he had the carriage of the tambourine. Pimer discounted that since Pergamal might very well sell the item here at the gather, since he could price it under the Harpercraft stall, Pergamal replied that he had to make more than a few splintered, splinters profit for his journey, his effort, and the rent of the stall from the Lord Holder. Pimer suggested that he consider the fine polish of the wood, listen again to the sweet jingle of the best quality metal, thinly hammered, just the sort of an instrument of lady to, for a lady to use. And a high tend evenly, no rough patches or stains. Mentally reals, realized that for all the extreme seriousness with which the two dickered, it was a game played according to certain rules, which Pimer must have learned at his foster mother's knee. The bargaining for the pipe went most went more smartly since Pergamal had noticed a pair of small holders waiting discreetly beyond the stall, but the bargaining was done and hand sealed. Pimer shaking his head at Pergamal's stinginess and sighing mightily as he pocketed the marks. Looking so dejected that Menelie was concerned, the boy motioned for her to follow him to the spot where the others waited. Halfway there, Pimer let out a sigh of relief and his face broke into the broadest of his happy grins. His step took on a jauntier bounce and his shoulders straightened. Told you I could get a fair deal out of Pergamal. You did? Mentally was confused. Sure did. Three and a half for the tambourine and three for the pipe. Top. That's top marks. The, boy crowded, the boys crowded around him and Pimer recounted his success with many winks and chuckles. For his efforts, he got a quarter of a mark from each of the boys telling mentally that that was an improvement for them for the full half mark the Harper Craft charged for selling. Come on, mentally, let's gad about. Pimer said, grabbing her by the arm and tugging her back into the stream of slowly moving people. I can smell the pies from here, he said when he had eluded the others. All we have to do is follow our noses. Pies? Master Robinson had mentioned bubbling pies. 
I don't mind treating you since today is your first gather here, he added hastily, looking to see if he'd offended her, but I'm not buying for those bottomless pits. We just finished dinner. Bargaining's hungry work, he licked his lips in anticipation, and I feel like something sweet, bubbling hot with berry juice. Just you wait. We'll duck through here. He maneuvered her through the crowd, going across the moving traffic in an oblique line until they reached a wide break in the square. There they could see down to the river and the meadow where the traders' beasts were grazing, cobbled. People were moving up all the roads, arriving from the outlying plain and mountain holes. Their dress tunics and shirts made bright accents to the fresh green of the spring fields. The sun shone brilliantly over all. It was a glorious day, thought mentally, a marvelous day for a gather. Timer grabbed her hand, pulling her faster. They can't have sold all the pies, she said, laughing. No, but they'll get cold and I like them hot, bubbling. And so the confections were carried from an oven in the baker's hold on a thick, long-handled tray. The berry juices spilling darkly over the sides of the delicately browned crust that glistened with crystallized sweet. Ho, oh, you're out early, are you, Pimer? Let me see your marks first. Pimer, with a show of great reluctance, dragged out a 30-second bit and showed it to the, to the skeptic. That'll buy you six pies. Six? Is that all? Pimer's face reflected utter despair. This is all me and my dorm mates could raise. His voice went up in a piteous note. Don't give me that old wheeze, Pimer, said the baker with a derisive snort. You know you eat them all yourself. You wouldn't treat your mates to as much as a sniff. Master Pollen, master me nothing, Pimer. You know my rank same as I know yours. It's six pies for the 32nd or stop wasting my time. The journeyman, for that was the badge on his tunic, was slipping six pies off the tray as he spoke. Who's your long friend here? That dorm mate always, you're always talking about? She's Manily. Manily, the baker looked up in surprise. The girl who wrote the song about the fire lizards? A seventh pie was set aside the, uh, set beside the others. Manily fumbled in her pocket for her two mark piece. Have a pie for welcome, Manily, and any time you have a spare egg that needs a warm home, he let out he let the sentence peter out and gave her a broad wink and a broader smile so she'd know he was joking mentally pimer grabbed her wrist staring at the two marker his eyes round with surprise where'd you get that master robinson gave it to me this morning he said i'm to buy a belt and some bubbly pies so please journeyman i'd like to pay for them no way pimer was flatly flatly indignant knocking her extended hand away I said it was my treat because this is your first gather and I know that's the first mark piece you've ever had. Don't you go wasting it on me. He had half turned from the baker and was giving mentally a one-eyed wink. Pimer, I don't know what I'd have done without you these past few days, she said, trying to move him out of her way so she could give Talon the mark, the marker. I insist, not a chance mentally, I keep my word. Then put your money where your mouth is, Pimer said Palin, you're blocking my counter. And he indicated the hulking figure of Camo bearing down on them. Camo, where have you been, Camo? cried Feimer. He looked all over for you before, oh, sorry. We looked all over for you before we started for the pies. Here's yours, Camo. Pies? And Camo came forward, huge hands outstretched, his thick lips moist. He wore a fresh tunic, his face was shining clean, and his straggling crop of hair had been brushed flat. He had evidently homed in on the sweet aroma of the pies as easily as Pimer. Yes, bubbly pies, just like I promised you, Camo. Pimer passed him two pies. Well, now, you wasn't having me on, was you, about feeding your mates? Although, how come Mentally and Camo? Here's your money, said Pimer with some haughtiness, thrusting his 30-second piece into Palin's hand. I trust your pies will live up to standard. Mentally gaped because there were now nine small bubbly pies on the counter front. Three for you, Camo. Pimer handed him a third. Now don't burn your mouth. Three for you, Mentally. And the pastry was warm enough to sting Mentally's scarred palm. And three for me. Thank you, Palum. It's good of you to be generous. I'll make sure everyone knows your pies. And despite the heat of the crust, Pimer bit deeply into the pastry. The dark purple juices dribbling down his chin are just as good as ever. And he said the last on a sigh of contentment. Then more briskly, come on, you two. He waved to the baker, who stared after them before he uttered a bark of laughter. See you later, Palum. 
Sorry, need a drink. We got nine pies for the price of six, she said when they'd got far enough away from the stall. Sure, and I'll get nine again when I go back because he'll think I'm sharing with you and Camo again. That's the best deal I've pulled on him yet. You mean, pretty smart of you to flash that two marker about. He wouldn't have been able to change it this early in the afternoon. I'll have to try that angle again next gather. The large marker, I mean. Heimer mentally was appalled at his duplicity. Hmm? His expression over the rim of his, the pie was unperturbed. Good, aren't they? Yes, but you're outrageous, the way you bargain. <clears throat> What's wrong with it? Everyone has fun, especially this early in the season. Later on, they get bored, and even being small and looking sorrowful doesn't help me. Oh, Camo. And Pimer looked disgusted. Can't you even eat clean? Pie's good, Camo said, stuffed all three pies into his mouth. His tunic was now stained with berry juices. His face was flecked with pastry and berry skins, and his fist had smeared a purple streak across one cheek. Mentally, will you look at him? He'll disgrace the hall. You can't take your eyes off him a moment. Come here. Pimer dragged Camo to the back of the line of stalls until he found a water skin dangling from a throng on a stall frame. He made Camo cup his hands and wash his face. Mentally found a scrap of cloth not too dirty and they managed to remove the worst of the pie stains from Camo's face and front. Oh, blast the shell and sear the skin, said Pimer with a round oath as he took up his third pie. It's cold. Camo, you're more trouble than you're worth sometimes. Camo, trouble? The man's face fell into deep, sorrowful lines. Camo, cold? No, the pie's cold. Oh, never mind. I like you, Camo. You're my friend. Pimer patted the man's arm reassuringly, and the numb wit brightened. Cold or not, Mentally said after she took a bite from her third, and cooled pastry, they're every bit as good as you said, Pimer. Says, it, and Pimer eyed her through narrowed lids. Maybe you'd better bargain the next lot out of Palum. I couldn't eat another. Oh, not now, later. It'll be my treat then. Sure thing, he agreed with such amiability that Mentally decided that she'd taken the bait, hook and all. First, he went on, let's find the tanner stall. He took her by the hand and Camo by the sleeve and hauled them down the row. You're, so you're really Master Robinson's apprentice? Wow, wait till I tell the others. I told him you would be. I don't understand you. Heimer shook her, shot her a startled look. He did say that you were his apprentice when he gave you that two marker, didn't he? He told me I was before today, but I didn't think that was unusual. After all, the apprentices in the hall, in the hall, after all, the apprentices in the hall, his apprentices, aren't all. I'm sorry, y'all, I'm tired. He's the master harper. You would sure don't understand, Pimer's glance was one of undiluted pity for her denseness. Every master has a few special apprentices. I'm Master Shonegars. That's why I'm always running his errands. I don't know how they did it in your sea hold, but here you get taken in as a general apprentice. If you turn out to be specially good at something like me at voice, and Brawley at making instruments, the master of the craft takes you on as a special apprentice and you report to him for extra training and duties. And if he's pleased with you, he'll give you the odd mark to spend at a gather. So if Master Robinson gave you a two marker, he's pleased with you and you're his special apprentice. He doesn't tap many. Heimer shook his head slowly from side to side with a soft emphatic whistle. There's been lots of heavy betting in the dorm as to who he'd pick since Siebel took his walk as journeyman. Not that Siebel didn't still look to the Master Harper, even if he is a rank up, but Ranley was sure he'd be tapped. Is that why Ranley didn't, doesn't like me? Pimer dismissed that with a gesture. Ranley had never had a chance, and the only one who didn't know that was Ranley. He thinks he's so good. Everyone else knew that Master Robinson was hoping to find you, and or the one who'd written those songs. Look, there's the tanner stall, and just spy that beautiful blue belt. It's even got a fire lizard for a belt buckle tongue. He he pulled her up and lowered her, his voice for the last word. And blue, you let me bargain here. Before she could agree, Pimer approached the stall, acting casually, glancing over the tabards, soft shoes and boots displayed, apparently oblivious to the belt he just indicated to Mentally. They've got some blue boot hide, Mentally, he said to her. Knowing the shrewdness Pimer had already displayed, Mentally followed his cue, and glancing at the tanner for permission, 
touched the thick, weary leather. She could see the belt over his shoulder and the tongue had been fashioned like a slim fire lizard. Now, don't tell me you have money in your trowels, short stuff, the tanner journeyman said to Pimer and then peered, peered uncertainly at Menelie's cropped hair, trousers and apprentice badge. Me? No, but she's buying. Her slippers are a disgrace. The tanner did look down and Menelie wanted to hide her scuffed footwear. This is Menelie, Pimer went on, blithingly unaware of the embarrassment he was causing her. She's got nine fire lizards and she's Master Robinson's new apprentice. Wondering what on earth was possessing Pimer, she glanced anywhere but at the curious journeyman. She caught a glimpse of bright, filmy materials and richly decorated tunics. She steadied her gaze and saw Pona, her arm through a tall lad's. He was wearing the yellow of Fort Hold and the shoulder knot of the Lord Holder's family. Behind Pona came Brilia, and Mania and Audiva, each of the girls escorted by a well-dressed youth, fosterlings of Lord Groves to judge by the different col hold colors of and rank knots. Here, Menelie, what do you think of this hide? asked Pimer. And be sure she has the marks for it, said Pona, pausing. Her voice was too smooth to be insulting, and yet her manner gave her words an offensive ring. For I'm certain she's only wasting your time and will finger your wearies dirty, whereas I want to commission you to make me some soft shoes for the summer. She held up a well-filled waist pouch. She's got two marks, Pimer said, turning to challenge Pona, his eyes flashing with anger. If she does, she stole it, replied Pona, abandoning her indolent manner. She's nothing on her she'd nothing on her when she was still permitted to live in the cot. Stolen, Menelie felt herself tensing with fury at the total unexpected accusation. Stolen nothing, Pimer replied haughtily. Master Robinson gave it to her this morning. I claim insult from you, Pona, cried Menelie, her hand on her belt knife. Bennis, she's threatening me, Pona cried, clinging to her escort's arm. Now see here, apprentice girl, you can't insult a lady of the holders. You just hand over the, the mark, that mark piece, said Bennis, gesturing preemptorily to Menelie. Menelie, don't take insult. Adiva pushed her way. Adiva pushed her way past the others and grabbed her arm, restraining her. It's what she wants. Pona gave me too many insults, Adiva. Menelie, you mustn't. But the mark, Bennis, Pona hit, said in a hiss, make her pay for threatening me. Out of the way, Bennis, whoever you are, said Menelie. Pona has to answer for the insults she gives lady holder or not. Menelie moved sideways, countering Pona's attempt to evade her. Venice, she can be dangerous. I told you so. Pona's voice went up in a frightened, breathless squeak. You mustn't, Menelie, Adiva said, catching Menelie's sleeve. She wants you to. Pimer, help me. Don't you dare, Adiva. Pona's voice was now edged with angry malice, or I'll settle you good as well. Come, girl, the money. Hand it over, and we'll say no more about attempted insult, said Venice in a patronizing tone. Pona's insulted mentally, cried Pimer indignantly, just because you're a... Close your mouth, Bennis wasted no courtesies on Pimer. He took a stride to close the distance between himself and Menelie. His jaw set in a disagreeable grin as he disdainfully measured the three slight and defiant adversaries. Pona gave a little squeal as Bennis left her standing on her own. Then another as Menelie, stepping away from Bennis, made a lunge at her, trying to catch her long plated braid. Hey now, just a minute, you, said the tanner in a loud voice. Sensing an imminent fight, he ducked under the counter of his stall, emerging into the walkway. This is a gather, not a... Bennis was quick on his feet, too, and he grabbed Menelie by the shoulder, spinning her towards him and securing her left arm, which he immediately twisted up behind her. With a cry of triumph, Pona darted forward, her hands busy with Menelie's belt pouch. Pimer sprang to Menelie's assistant, kicking Bennis in the shins and grabbing Pona by the hair. The kick made Bennis loosen his hold on Menelie's arm. With a strength developed by turns of hauling and handling heavy nets, she wrenched free of his grasp, dancing out of his way. Hold on, sorry. Ugh. Hold on. Okay. Need a drink of water. <sighs> Mouth is all dry. <clears throat> <clears throat> I settle Pona, she shouted it to Pimer, looking away, beckoning him away, sorry. Venice, save me, Pona screamed, rushing to save, rushing to save the young holder, but Pimer was still hanging onto her plate. Venice let fly a kick at Pimer, 
chirping him up and added another one to the ribs as the boy measured his length in the dust. Leave him alone, forgetting her quarrel with Pona, mentally launched herself at Venice. Putting shoulder and body behind her fist, she drove it right into Venice's face. He staggered back, back, roaring in outrage and pain. One of the other fosterlings came charging forward, fist cocked to slap Menely, but Adiva hung onto his arm. Vidirian, Menely's a sea holder, help us. Startled, her escort bounded in to help Adiva, just as Menely ducked under Venice's swing and tried to protect Pima, who was struggling to get to her feet, blood streaming from his nose. The next moment, the air was full of shrieking, clawing, fighting fire lizards. Pimer was screaming that Venice better not hit the Harper's Apprentice or there'd be real trouble. Camo was howling that his pretties, pretty ones were afraid and he waded in, thick arms flailing, hitting indiscriminately at friend or foe. Menely got a clout across the ear as she tried to restrain the misguided Camo. Shells, it's the hall's dummy. Scatter, get her, knock him down, got her, Menely. The fire lizards were not hampered by Camo's inability to distinguish friend and foe. They went for Pona, Grilia, Amania, Venice, and the other lads. Menely, trying to catch her breath, realized that things were completely out of hand and desperately tried to call off the fire lizards. The girls were scattering, screaming, vainly trying to cover their heads, hair, and eyes. Attacked from above, so did the fosterlings. Be still, everyone. The bellow was stentorian enough to penetrate shriek, hollow, and battle cries and stern enough to command instant obedience. You there, hang on to Camo. douse him with that skin of water. But you, Tanner, help them with Camo. Sit on him, knock his feet out from under him if necessary. Mentally, control your fire lizards. This is a gather, not a brawl. The harper strode into the midst of the melee, yanking a fosterling to his feet, spinning one of the girls to the arms of the folk who had converged on the scene, giving a bloody nosed pimer a hand up from the dust. The Master Harper's actions were somewhat hampered by the distressed squeals of the little bronze fire lizard clinging tightly to his left arm, but there was little doubt of the Master's fury. A silence broken by the gulping sobs of Pona and Brilia left or held attackers and tact and witnesses alike. Now, said the Harper, his voice controlled, although his eyes were flashing with anger, just what has been going on here? It was her, Pono staggered a step towards Master Robinson, jabbing her finger at Menely and struggling to control her sobs. Long scratches marred her cheeks. Her headscarf was torn and her hair pulled from its plait. She's always causing trouble. Sir, we were minding our own business, said Pimer indignantly, which was buying a belt that you said Menely ought to have when Pona here, that little sneak tripped me as we were passing and then her heinous beast attacked all of us. They've done it before, I have witnesses. She stopped mid-gulp, arrested by the look on the harper's face. Lady Pona, he said in an all too gentle voice, you are overwrought. Brilia, take the child back to Junka. The excitement of a gather appears to be too much for such a fragile spirit. Amania, I think you ought to help Brilia. Though his voice expressed concern for their well-being, it was obvious that the harper was disciplining the three girls who bore evidence of the unfriendly attentions of the fire lizards. Now he turned to the hold fosterling, Venice, his left eye already bruising, his lip cut, his hair tousled and forehead bearing fire lizard marks, was straightening his tunic and brushing dust from his sleeves and trousers. The other youths who had been escorting the now banished girls maintained the rigid stance they had adopted as soon as they recognized the Master Harper. Lord Bennis, Master Harper, Bennis continued to adjust his garments, awarding the briefest of glances to the Harper. I'm glad you know my rank, said Robinson, smiling slightly. Menley had been soothing Beauty and Rocky, who had refused to leave when she sent the others away. At, this, at his tone, she looked at the Harper, amazed that he could express so profound a reprimand with a brief phrase and a smile. One of the other fosterlings jabbed Bennis in the ribs and the young man looked angrily about. I expect you have business elsewhere. Now, said the master harper. Business? This is a gather day, sir. For others indeed it is, but not I think for you, said the master harper, indicated with his hand <clears throat> that Bennis had, been, had better retire. Or you and you and you, he added, indicating the other fosterlings who displayed claw marks. Will you occupy yourselves quietly in your quarters, or will I have to mention this to Lord Grow? 
He accepted the frantic shakings of their heads. <clears throat> then he turned his back on them and pleasantly indicated to those who were avidly observing his summary justice that they should now continue their uninterrupted pursuits. He walked to where Camo was still being restrained by three large journeymen blubbering noisily about his pretties being hurt and struggling to free himself. The pretties are not hurt, Camo, not hurt. See, Menely has the pretties. The harper's voice soothed the wretched man as he gestured for Menely to come forward into Camo's line of sight. Pretties not hurt. No, Camo, Brudigan, who else is about? The harper asked his journeyman. Several other harpers obediently moved against the tide of the dispersing crowd. Camo had better go back to the hall, here. And the harper reached into his pouch and passed Brudigan a mark piece. Buy him a lot of those bubbly pies on your way back. That'll help settle him. The crowd had melted away. The master harper, stroking his gradually quieting fire lizard, turned back to the small group still clustered together. He gestured them to the unoccupied space between the nearest stalls. Now, let me hear the sequence of events, please, he said, but his voice no longer held that chilling note of displeasure. It wasn't Menelie's fault, said Pimer, batting at Adiva's hands as she tried to staunch the flow from his nose with the berry-stained cloth used earlier on Camo. We were looking at belts. He turned to the tanner for confirmation. I don't know about belts, Master Romanton, but they weren't causing any trouble when the blonde girl, Lady Pona, started pulling rank on your apprentice made a nasty accusation about the girl having money she oughtn't to have. A look of dismay crossed the harper's face. You didn't lose the mark in the fuss, did you, Menelie? He scuffed, he, he scuffed around the trampled area with his boot toe. I don't have many two mark pieces, you know. The tanner stifled a bark of laughter and the harper sighed with almost comic relief as Menelie solemnly displayed the cause of the trouble. <clears throat> That's a mercy, Master Robinson said with a smile of approval for Menelie. Go on, he added to the tanner. Then this lass, and the tanner gestured towards Adiva, took Menelie's part. So did the young seaholder. I think all would have come to nothing if Camo hadn't got upset. And the next thing I know, the air's full of fire lizards. Are they all hers? He jerked his thumb at Menelie. Yes, said the harper. A fact that ought to be born in mid, in mid since they mind Sorry, guys. A fact that ought to be borne in mind, since they do seem able to recognize Menelie's... Um, Sir, I didn't call them, Menelie said, finding her voice. I'm sure you didn't need to. He closed his hand reassuringly on her shoulder. Master Robinson, Pona bears a grudge against Menelie, said Adiva in a rush, as if she had to make the admission before she could change her mind. She's got no real cause at all. Thank you, Adiva. I've been aware of the prejudice. The harper made a slight bow, acknowledging the tall girl's loyalty. The Lady Pona will not trouble you further, Menelie, nor you, Adiva, he continued, that hint of an implacability, tinging and otherwise pleasant tone. Good of you, Lord Vidirian, to support another sea holder, though it is a loyalty I would prefer to render unnecessary. My father, Master Robinson, is very much of your mind, which is why I am fostered in a land-bound hold said Vidirian with a respectful bow. He stiffened, his eyes widening at some disturbing sight. He swallowed hard, anxiety plainly written on his face. Ah, said the harper, having followed the direction of Vidirian's gaze. I wondered how long it would take Lord Gro to respond to promptings. He grinned, highly amused at some inner reflection. Vidirian, do make off with Adiva now. You enjoy yourselves. Adiva needed no urging and grabbed the young seaholder's arm hastening down the aisle until they were lost in the crowd. It's Lord Grow, said Pimer in a croak, pulling at Menelie's sleeve. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. The harper caught the boy by the shoulder. You'll stay by me, young Pimer, so we may have an end of this affair now. Then he turned to the tanner, which belt tempted Menelie, the one with the fire lizard on the buckle, said Pimer in an undertone to the harper, and then edged himself carefully so that the harper was between him and the oncoming Lord Holder. Robinson, my queen's doing it again. Ah, Menelie, just the person, said Lord Grow, his florid face lighting with a smile. Murga's been, hump, she stopped. The Holder regarded his queen accusingly. She's been fussing right up until I reached the square. That's rather easily explained, said Robinson in an offhanded manner. Is it? Both of them are at it now. 
Menely had been aware of it first because Beauty was chirping and squeaking at Murga through Lord Grove's conversation. She felt color rising in her cheeks. The discourse finished as quickly as it had begun. The two little queens flipped their wings closed on their backs and became totally disinterested in each other. What was that all about? Lord Grow demanded. I suspect they were catching up on the news, said Robinson with a chuckle, for that was what it had sounded like, a spat of urgent gossip. Which reminds me, Lord Grow, I heard that the wine man has a keg of good aged bend in wine. He does? Lord Grow's interest was diverted. How did he get his hands on it? I think we ought to check. Hump, yes, now. Wouldn't do to waste good bend and wine on people unable to appreciate it, would it? Robinson took Lord Grove's arm. Not at all. But the harper could not be completely diverted and turned to frown at Menely. She steeled herself before she realized that his frown was not menacing. Want a chance to talk to this girl? Didn't seem the time or place to do so t'other day with the hatching and all. Of course, Lord Grove, when Menely's finished her bargaining. Bargaining? Humph. Well, can't interrupt a bargain at a gather. Humph. Lord Grow pushed out his lower lip as she, he looked from mentally to the hovering tanner. Don't be all day about it, girl. The afternoon's a good time to talk. Don't have many chances to sit and talk. Finish your dicker for that belt, mentally, the harper told her, one arm gently propelling the Lord Holder away from the apprentices. And then join us at the, wine, at the wine men's stall. And you, the master harper, four fingers, hi, say hi, four fingers closed and stay out of trouble and at least until I've had some bend and wine to fortify me. Lord Grow humped at the delay, if, if it is bend and wine. This way, my Lord Holder. The two men walked off together in step, each steadying the fire lizards they carried. A soft whisper or whistle at her ear broke the trance holding mentally as she stared after the two most influential men in the hold. Pimer was dras dramatically dragging a hand across his brow to signalize a close escape. What do you bet, Menely, that the subject of your cracking Bennis in the face never comes up? And where'd you learn to punch like that? When I saw that big bully kicking you, I was so flaming mad. I, I, may I add my congratulations to Pimers, asked a quiet voice, and the two, the two whirled to see Siebel leaning against the side of the tanner's stall. His eyes, the eyes of his young queen were still whirling with the red of anger. Oh no. Time to lay down. Say night, night. Go night, lay night. down, turn off the lights. <sighs> oh no, said Menely with a groan. Not you too. What am I going to do with them? She was utterly discouraged and dejected. It had been bad enough to have the fire lizards diving and swooping at plain noise. Outrageous of them to have flown at Master Domic because he'd only spoken angrily to her, and now this very public fracas with the son of the Fort Lord Holder. It wasn't your fault, Melanie, said Pimer stoutly. It never is, but it is. How long have you been here, Siebel? Pimer asked, ignoring Menelie's wail. On the heels of Lord Grow, said the journeyman, grinning, but I caught a glimpse of the young Bennis making tracks out of the hold proper, so it wasn't hard to figure out where he got the scratches. He went on, glancing at the perched fire lizards and absently stroking Kimmy. I have only been one burning question. Who had the audacity to give Bennis a colored eye? A rare sight that was, said the tanner who had been keeping back, but now stepped up. The girl landed his, as sweet a punch in that young snot's eye as ever I've seen. And I've been to many a gather that boated, boasted a good brawl. Now, young Harper girl, which belt had you in mind before the fracas started? I thought you was after boot leather. He eyed Primer sharply. Menely wants the blue one with the fire lizard buckle. It, it'd, it'd be much too expensive, Menely said hastily. The tanner ducked back under his counter and picked the coveted belt from its hook. This the one? Menely looked at it wistfully. Siebel took it from the tanner's hands, examined it, gave it a tug to see if there were flaws or if the hide was too thin to wear well. Ah. Good workmanship in that belt, journeyman, the tanner said. Proper for the girl to have it, with her owning the fire lizards. How much were you asking for it, asked Pimer, settling down to the business of bargaining. The tanner looked down at Pimer, stroked the belt, which Siebel had handed back to him, then glanced at Melanie. Melanie, sorry. Go lay down. Did you get that bell? No. It smells like bubbles. Okay. Um, 
It's yours, girl, and I'll not take a mark from you. Worth it to me to see you plant one on that young rowdy's face. Here, wear it in good health and long life. Timer gaped, mouth wide, eyes popping. Oh, I couldn't, said Menel and mentally extended the two mark piece. The tanner promptly closed her fist over the marker and laid the belt on her wrist. Yes, you could and you will, Apprentice Harper, and that's the end of the matter. I've struck the bargain. He pumped her hand in the traditional courtesy. Ah, Tanner Ligand, Siebel stepped up, leaning on the counter and beckoning the tanner to bend close to him. Well, I don't see much of the affair. See, well, I didn't see much of the affair. Siebel began to rub his forefinger on the side of his nose. It's not exactly the sort of incident. I take your meaning, Harper Siebel. The tanner replied, nodding his head in acceptance of the adroit suggestion. His grin was rueful. Not that the truth doesn't make fine telling. Still, those fire lizards of yours are young, aren't they, girl? Excitable like, not used to a gather, I expect. Oh, I say, I'll say that's proper. Don't you worry, Harpers. He patted Menelie's hand, still outstretched with the marker. Now cheer up. You've a face like a wet turn. You've done more good than harm this gather day. And when you've the need for slippers to match the belt, just you send me to work. I won't do you in the mark. And he flashed a look at the skeptical Pimer. Not that I don't like a good tight bargain now and then. Pimer made a gargling sound in his throat and would have disputed the statement. Let's clean you up, Pimer, as Master Robinson suggested, said Siebel, warning the boy by the tilt of his head to be silent. I have a water carrier at the back of the stall you're welcome to use, said Ligand. And there's a cleaner cloth than the one Menely has. He held out a white square to her and dismissed her profuse thanks with a smile and a wave to be off. No sooner had Siebel and Menely pulled Pimer to the back of the tanner stall than people began to step up to his counter. Ha, said Pimer, looking over his shoulder. He's sly, that ligand, giving you the belt. He'll get three times as much business because you... Close your mouth, suggested Siebel, as he rubbed firmly at the bloody streaks on Pimer's face. Hold him, Menely. Hey, I... But Pimer's complaints were effectively muffled by the damp cloth Siebel used in earnest. The less mention about this matter, Pimer, the better. And what I said to ligand holds for you as well. Here and in the hall, there'll be no... There'll be enough rumor and wrangle without you adding your bits. Okay, almost done. Do you think, mumble, mumble, I'd do anything, leave me alone to hurt mentally? Siebel suspended the cleaning operation and regarded the boy's flashing eyes and the indignant set of his jaw. No, I guess you wouldn't, if only not to lose your chances at feeding the fire lizards. Now that's not fair. Siebel, what am I going to do about them? Mentally asked, finally getting out the fears she'd been suppressing. They only they were only protecting me, Pimer began, but Siebel silenced them, him with a hand over his mouth and a stern look. Today they apparently had cause, as Pimer said. The other evening they reacted to what was going on at Benden Weir with Fenora and Kent and through Breck's fire lizard. Again, cause. Siebel glanced back toward the tanner's stall and noticed that some of the throng were surreptitiously regarding the three harpers. He motioned to Menely and Pimer to walk out of sight down behind the stalls, away from the curious. All of this, and Siebel's hand took in the towering face of the whole cliff behind them. The Harper Hall across the paved square, now lined with the stalls, is as new to you as to them, enough to cause alarm and apprehension. They're young, and so are you for all you've managed to accomplish. It's again a question of discipline, he said, but his smile was reassuring. I had no discipline this afternoon, she said, repenting of her attack on Pona. She might well have jeopardized everything, crying insult from Pona. What do you mean? You had a fantastic right punch, cried Pimer, demonstrating with a grunt, and you'd every right to cry insult on Pona after all she's done to you. Pimer hastily covered his mouth, his eyes widening as he realized he was being Discreet. You cried insult on Pona? asked Siebel, frowning in surprise. I thought that Sylvina had told and I told you to leave the matter. She called me a thief. She tried to get Bennis to take my two marker from me. The two marker that Master Robinson himself had given mentally to buy that belt, said Pimer, staunchly confirming the affair. If Pona has added insult to the injury she's already tried to do you, said Siebel slowly, then of course you had to take action mentally. He smiled slightly, his eyes still considering her face. In fact, it's good to know that you will take action on your own behalf, but the fire lizard's part. 
I didn't call them Siebel, but when Bennis tripped Pimer and then kicked him, I was scared. He just lay there. Sure, smartest thing to do in a kicking fight, Pimer replied unperturbed. I cannot, however, condone apprentices fighting with each other or with holders, especially holders of any rank. Bennis is the biggest bully in the hold, Siebel, and you know we've all had trouble with him. Enough, youngster, said Siebel, more sharply than Menley had yet heard him speak, as quiet and self-effacing as the journeyman usually was when he spoke in that authoritative tone of voice. It would take a stalwart person to disobey him. That was not, however, what I meant by discipline, Menley. I meant the ability to stick with a project like the song you wrote yesterday. Was it really only yesterday? He added, he smiled tenderly down at Kimmy, who was now asleep in a ball, snuggled between his body and elbow. You wrote a new song? Pimer brightened. You didn't tell me. When, when will I get to hear it? When will you get to hear it? Menely heard her voice cracking on the last few words. What's the matter, Menely? Siebel took her arm and gave her a little shake, but she could only stare at them. It's just that it's so different. She stammered, unable to express the upheaval in her mind. The reversal of all that she had been expected to do. Do you know? Do you know what used to happen to me when I wrote a song? She tried to stop the words that were threatening to burst from her, but she couldn't. Not with Pimer's face contorted with distress for her, and Siebel quietly encouraging her to speak with, with the sympathy so plain on his face. I used to get beaten by my father for tuning, for twiddles, as he called them. When I cut my hand, she held it up, looking at the red scar and then turning it to them. Gutting pack tails, they let it heal all wrong so I wouldn't be able to play. They wouldn't even allow me to sing in the hall for fear Harper Algian would figure out that it was me who taught the children after Petrian died. They were ashamed of me. They were afraid I'd disgrace them. That's why I ran away. I'd rather have died of thread score than live in half circle another night. Tears of bitter and keenly felt injustice streamed down Menelie's cheeks. She was aware of Pimer urgently begging her not to cry, that it was all right, she was safe now, and he loved every one of her songs even the ones he hadn't heard, and he'd tell her father a thing or two if he ever met him. She was conscious that Siebel had put his arm around about her shoulders and was stroking her with awkward consolation, but it was Beauty's anxious chirping in her ear that reminded her that she'd better get her emotions under control. Master Robinson and Lord Grow wouldn't be pleased by a second alarm incited by her lack of self-discipline particularly if it dragged them away from good bend and wine. She dashed the tears from her eyes and gulping down one last sob, looked defiantly into the startled faces of Siebel and Pimer. And I wanted you to teach me how to gut fish, Siebel let out a long sigh. I wondered why you were so hesitant. I'll find someone else now. I understand why you hate it. Oh, I want to teach you, Siebel. I want to do everything I can. If it's gutting fish or teaching you to sail, I might... I may be only a girl, but I'm going to be the best harper in the entire hall. Easy, Menelie, said Siebel, laughing at her excess. I believe you. I do too, said Pimer in a low, intense tone of reassurance. I never knew you'd had that kind of hold life. Didn't anyone ever listen to your songs? Petrion did, but after he died. I can see now why, you, why it's been so hard for you, Menelie, to appreciate how important your songs are. After what you've been through, and Siebel gently squeezed her left hand. It would be hard to believe in yourself. Promise me, Menely, to believe from now on. Your songs are very important to the harper, to the hall, and to me. Master Domic's music is brilliant, but yours appeals to everyone, holder and crafter, landsman and seaman. Your songs deal with subjects like the fire lizard and Brex called Fenor and Kant that will help change the sort of set attitudes that nearly killed you in your home hold. There's something wrong in not appreciating one's own special abilities, my girl. Find your own limitations, yes, but don't limit yourself with false modesty. That's what I've always liked about Menelie. She's got her head on right, said Pimer with the all the sen sentence, oh, big words, y'all, sententiousness of an ancient uncle. Menelie sententiousness. Manalee looked at her friend and then began to laugh as much at Pimer as at herself. Her outburst had at long last lifted a weight of intolerable depression. She straightened her shoulders and smiled at her friends, flinging out her arms to signal her release. They all heard the happy warbling of the fire lizards. Beauty crooned with pleasure, rubbing her head against Manalee's cheek 
and Kimmy gave a drowsy chirp that made the trio of Harpers laugh. You are feeling better now, aren't you, Mentally? said Pimer. So we'd better follow orders, because it doesn't do to keep a Lord Holder waiting, much less Master Robinson. You've got your belt, and I'm washed up, so we'd better get to the wineman's stall. Mentally hesitated just a moment. Well, asked Siebel, raising his eyebrows to encourage her to answer. What if he finds out I'm the one who hit Venice? Not from Venice he won't, replied Pimer with a snort. Besides, he's got 15 sons and only one fire lizard. He wants to talk to you about her. Not even the Master Harper knows as much about fire lizards as you do. Come on. That is the end of chapter nine. First word of chapter 10 is then. And that is all for this evening. It is an hour and 25 minutes into the live stream. And I think we have done quite enough for the night. And I think it's after 10. I thought I heard the cuckoo clock. 9.30. Okay, so that's not too bad. All right. Guess what? What? I'm named after a fire lizard. <laughs> I'm Kimberly. The fire lizard Kimmy. named Kim. The fire lizard's named Kimmy and you're Kimmy. Yeah, my okay. nickname is Kimmy. So I know that Rebecca's behind because she had some classes so that's probably why she didn't jo excuse me join us and um everybody else is here that's been that. watching us re that. regularly so um it's all good um i hope that you have a great evening we'll see you later good night <laughs>